The other critical point that was mostly indirectly made this morning was uh, really kind of came up in Courtney's reference to what a bank can and can't be expected to do. And my way of uh, summarizing this is to say a lot of the way you think about climate change risk depends on where you sit. And the kind of analysis that's being done, for example, in the UK climate impact study is something that makes a lot of sense at the level of a country with the resources and the time frames and the public responsibilities that governments have. But a lot of what we do as financial institutions, especially at the IFC, because we're, for those of you who don't know us, we are a totally private sector focused international financial institution. So we're, we are not even allowed to loan to governments except for sub-sovereign. So we, we have the perspective very close to that of commercial banks and our clients who are enterprise fac uh, or facility managers. And what that means is that the time frames are shorter, the geographic areas are typically much smaller. Sometimes they can be as large as a hydro storage impoundment for a hydro project, but they might be as small as a factory border or a hotel, which are all things that we lend for. And consequently, the ability to assess risk at that scale for such short time periods is a very significant challenge and constraint. And I'm also, uh, I, I could point out a number of people in the room, but I'll just refer to uh, Richenda Connell, who's been a primary consultant with us, uh, and he'll be speaking to you in a couple of the later sessions, helping us try to figure out what, how can we get a handle. And I'll talk about some of what we've been doing. Uh, and then there's going to be a separate session following this one at 345 on insurance perspectives. So I'm not going to go into that one uh, further. We will have a World Bank presentation about it. But I am going to refer specifically to some of the difference in long-term asset owners. And this includes, for example, some of the uh, trillions of dollars held by pension funds, uh, which is a very enticing um, focus for climate change because it would seem to be people who both control a lot of money and have a much longer time horizon than would be typical of a, a project finance or standard uh, banking. So starting uh, generally from a financing perspective, this is just um, a subset of some of the ways in which climate change can directly and indirectly affect financial performance. And not all of these are um, so obvious or easily known without really looking at the business that you have and delving into some of the details. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. But you, you would, for example, expect, uh, if you're in agriculture or forestry, that you would be sensitive to temperature and precipitation. But it's a lot less obvious if you're running a manufacturing facility whether, for example, your operation and maintenance costs for operating a boiler or your uh, trucking fleet might be affected. And depending on the kind of business that you run, uh, you really have to get down to the level of specifics in order to evaluate uh, whether your depreciation schedules might be affected. And in uh, some of the case studies that we've done so far, we've actually tried to follow this chain and see how it plays out under different uh, climate change assumptions. So a lot of this, where we are now, is attempting to develop some of the tools. And I think this did come out a little bit this morning. And I suspect this afternoon and tomorrow it'll be another, it'll be a much more focused topic for conversation. Um, some of this is, again, fairly straightforward. If you're going to try to look at the climate risk from a financial perspective, then you probably are talking about downscaling and focusing on shorter time frames than the IPCC. And, and you're, you're, you're not going to find a lot of financial advisors who are willing to talk about 2080. That's just the reality of the banking business. And you won't be able to, to attract a lot of participants in a study of 2080 risk. Um, you also get into uh, a, a very fertile area of climate modeling investigation, which was somewhat a uh, uh, little bit brought into Bob's uh, presentation, which is what do you do when you have conflicting model results? 
as is often the case, particularly with precipitation. And there are a variety of techniques and tools that are uh, very active areas of, of research right now. Um, and then there are the response uh, measures once you've tried to put some handle on the risk, the risk management, which essentially comes down to how to reduce vulnerabilities and increase adaptive capacity. And again, I think there'll be uh, opportunities throughout the course of today and tomorrow in getting into some of the ways that we're working on this. I did want to what make one um, sort of personal bugaboo comment here, which is that as I've read a lot of the literature on the economics of adaptation to date, I think that there is some risk of looking under the lamppost in the sense that we are attracted in quantify, especially in economics, to quantifying what we know best, whether it is necessarily, in fact, a sufficient or accurate representation of the full extent of the risks that are out there. And particularly in several of the areas that Bob described, the collapse of ecosystems and in the area of military conflicts and the risks, for example, of what happens in water short areas when, when uh, tensions over water, migration caused in areas uh, where migration is already causing problems. Uh, Pakistan may be a clear case in point where um, a lot of the tensions and military costs that are being incurred there are clearly in part due to some of the um, post-flooding uh, um, damage imposed on government capacity there. And a, lot, on a number of uh, defense analytical studies are coming out about this, but they are quite a bit removed from the economics and risk management literature. They're, they're definitely in a, in, a, uh, in a different forum. Uh, but the bottom line is to ignore these and assume that their economic relevance is zero is clearly wrong. And yet, for many, many purposes, that is still uh, the de facto assumption. So what have we so far tried to do about this? And I'll just give a couple, uh, two examples primarily from EPA, both of which are referenced in publications, which I've included at the end of my presentation. The first is that, again, with help, a lot of help from, uh, from Chen, from Rachenda Connell, who helped us conceptualize this, we set about looking at some of our portfolio investments. And we just went to the client and said, we'd like to offer you a free service. <laughs> it wasn't entirely free because we needed them to give us their time and management attention, and frankly, to open their books to us. And th that, was, that was a bit of the hard part, and we talk a little bit about the practical side of doing this in our report. But we uh, have just put out a publication that describes the first three of these studies, a uh, 60 megawatt hydro investment in Nepal, a uh, pulp and paper packaging company in Pakistan. We had to do it as a desk study. Uh, unfortunately, it was just after the Islamabad bombing and uh, our trip got canceled, some of the, the risks of development work. And finally, a palm oil uh, uh, plantation and processor in Ghana. So we had uh, three um, very different sectors and different types of climate risks. And it's a little bit difficult to read here, but I'll just tell you this is all laid out in the publication. And uh, um, Richenda will be also uh, describing some of the methodological issues in some of your um, presentation later. Um, but my point is just that at one end of the climate uh, literature, you will see what is the cost of climate change in a very global macro sense. But what is still very rare and, and frankly difficult work that is still just getting fully uh, uh, out there is the opposite end of the spectrum, going out and looking at individual projects and attempting to find out, are they going to be affected by temperature, precipitation, storms, melting of the permafrost in uh, uh, laying down rail tracks in northern China, all of these kinds of things. And the, the answer is that almost in every case, uh, what you find is not always what you expected in advance. The one other project, again, getting through this kind of quickly so we can have a discussion, is we've been a partner in a climate change asset allocation study, which as far as we know is the first of its kind. This was a study organized by uh, Mercer, a London-based uh, risk management and uh, asset allocation 
advisory firm. They're very sophisticated in the financial uh, uh, and, and portfolio management industry, working with pension funds and other large institutional asset owners. And the study that they um, have uh, is fairly far along was supported by IFC, the Carbon Trust, and 14 institutional investors. I've included some of the logos here. And what they've attempted to do using scenario-based analysis, somewhat again along the lines that Bob described for the UK study, is to evaluate the long-run impact on, uh, of climate change on the portfolios of these big asset management companies. And to do so by sector, so infrastructure, uh, agriculture, forestry, et cetera, by region, and by financial instrument to see whether one could distinguish how climate change might differentially affect equity versus uh, shorter term lending, um, et cetera. And then to do this analysis out to 2030, which frankly is about as far as most asset management companies really wanted to go, but partly at uh, our insistence and the Carbon Trust, uh, we did push to get it out to 2050 because I think as Bob can attest to get uh, the kind of uh, clear, solid climate impact information out to 2030 was, was still kind of difficult. Uh, the final report is uh, now being prepared and will be out early next year. So um, there's not a lot yet that can be discussed publicly about it except to say that the study is, is in its final stages. But I think, again, it's indicative of the interest and awareness of climate change that is finally coming about within the uh, financial sector. And you're, you're going to see more and more of this kind of work coming. Um, now, I've talked a lot about uncertainty, so I thought that, uh, and again, I think Bob made a comment like this, that while uncertainty is, of course, an analytical challenge, it's hardly something that is unknown, unheard of, uh, and, and never before confronted by impact ass assessment. And I, I like this particular quote that I found uh, in preparing for this presentation from a military analyst uh, saying that while the data on climate change may be uncertain, it's at least as good, if not better, than a lot of uh, military uh, strategy, which is done out to 2040 and 2050 as the basis for multi-billion dollar investments in weapons systems and strategy all the time. So, you know, that's just, that's just one of, uh, and then I'll just, uh, one minute, and I'll just, I'll close here. I think um, a lot of this within our institutions, as uh, you'll hear, is being taken up in a variety of contexts. The performance standards, I already mentioned, um, Greg Radford here is managing those for IFC as we're revising them and looking at how climate change can be more specifically referenced. Every investment has a risk section in it, so there is a logical place for discussing th these issues frequently. We're doing these pilot studies. We're working on various insurance products. We're also including um, climate risks in our uh, advisory services. An example is promoting salt-resistant seeds now, commercial products in Bangladesh. And we're beginning to look at more public-private cooperation, which I think will be another major area. Uh, these are the two publications which I referred to. And with that, I'll close. Thanks. Thank you.